That's the road. Somebody there. Yes, this is the traffic out of Jerusalem, heading uh, heading towards 443 through the territories. Hello, Jono. You know what this is. Yeah, and I'm clean shaven. Okay, so I'm going to try and explain something and see if I can explain it on a video. And uh, you're free to get bored and piss off. But I wanted to explain what computer modelling is and how it relates to climate change and the entire industry that is built around computer models uh, that predict, that say that they can predict what the climate will be. And I want to give you people an example. Right now I am sitting in traffic and I ran a computer simulation to tell me which would be the best way to get from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. And it's called Waze and that is computer modelling. And that simulation told me that uh, this particular road that I'm on, 443, despite the pretty heavy traffic that's on it, which is freeing up right now, that simulation said that this would be the quickest way back to Tel Aviv for me tonight. And it's a pretty damn good simulation. It's a computer simulation. So what it does is it knows where I am, it knows where I want to go, knows the length of all the roads in between. Uh, it knows not only the speed limits and my normal driving speeds, but, and this is what's very clever about Waze, it knows what is going on along that road at the minute that you run the simulation for the first time. So that first time when I turned it on in Jerusalem and I said, how long is it going to take me to get back to Tel Aviv? And it said one hour, 15 minutes. It could look and see what the traffic was like at that instant. But what it can't do is predict the future. So if somebody were to have an accident two kilometers in front of me right now, then its earlier prediction would be wrong. So Waze is, it's a computer simulation that we all use very often. Okay, so what does this relate to how science works and climate change? Just about every prediction of global warming, or it comes from a computer model, uh, very much like Waze. It's like, it's like predicting that, that, that my arrival time in Tel Aviv is the same as a climate model trying to predict what the average temperature of the world will be in 50 years. The thing is that Waze has got a very small universe. It's got cars and roads that are fixed in geography and space. It's got speeds which don't vary very much. It's got a few events that can happen like an accident or a roadblock or, or those, that's all that can happen. Whereas when we try and predict what the average temperature of the world will be in 50 years or 100 years, think of the enormous amount of stuff we just don't know. We have absolute, we don't even know what the increasing level of CO2 in our atmosphere, which is, that's an absolute fact, that's measurable today. We can measure how much CO2 there is as a percentage of the atmosphere now, and we have reasonably accurate measurements without doing any map, without doing anything very clever back for 50 years or more. Those are measurements, but they're just part of what has to go into this entire model to do a computer simulation to predict the entire future of the climate. And so this is what I've said to anybody along the way is that the very idea that the that scientists who are put on a pedestal are clever enough to have built a computer simulation or a number of computer simulations that can predict the future of the world, that's where I believe it, it's just monstrous hubris. It's just palpably silly. Um, predicting the weather tomorrow, the next day, the day after, a week from now, it's pretty much, it's a similar problem to predicting the climate in 50 or 100 years. And we can't even do that. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I got a PhD writing a computer simulation of how a very, very idealized plastic would flow. 
and I used to spend, uh, I used to have a computer simulation that I wrote run for a whole weekend on a, what at the time was a very fast silicon graphics computer. And at the end of that, it would tell me, if I was lucky, something of an approximation of what would happen in 40 seconds into the future in a box that was one centimeter by two centimeters. That was the, that was the, that was the sum total of what I was trying to simulate. It was tiny. And for me to even imagine that anybody could have the, the, the hubris to scale that process up to the size of the world and think that they're gonna get something useful from it, I, ju I just don't believe that it's a branch of science that has much meaning. And then I'll just, I'll just tack on another little discussion that I've been wanting to have, which is about the 95% or 98% or 99% of scientists who agree. When I did my PhD, when I started it, the entire world, uh, which at that time was probably 150 or 200 academics, <laughs> the entire world was simulating the flow of plastics by taking all the equations for air or water and changing them a bit, adding factors, adding more coefficients as it's known, changing the equations, but just extending them. They weren't really rewriting the rule book. And plastics uh, and this is all polymeric liquids if you know what that means are very very different from water or air uh, and so the simulation tools that they were using were just never giving very good answers they could be trained and uh, directed in certain circumstances to give a, an okay answer but they weren't generally widely applicable tools now my boss, my PhD supervisor, he had a radically different idea and he came with that idea and said we're going to do a totally different way of calculating and a totally new form of equation that's never been tried before and our, our equation is actually going to remember what happened to certain regions of the fluid as it flows. It, it, was, it, it necessitated me writing a totally a uh, novel form of computer simulation for fl flow of liquids that had never been written before, never been tried. And I sat and did this for three years and I had a, a co-worker uh, who sat on the mathematics and my boss oversaw both of us. And my job was to take his mathematics, my co-worker's mathematics, and turn them into a computer simulation that we could run. And I largely did this. And after three years, uh, I went to an international conference to present our work and we already saw by then that our simulation was producing much, much better results than anything that had ever been tried in 40 years previous. So I went to a conference in Quebec with basically, uh, I think I was given three minutes plus two minutes for questions to present three and a half years of work at that point. And uh, my co-worker who did the mathematics was also given similar time. And I presented this work to a room full of people who'd been doing one thing one way with minor changes from each of them building on each other for 40 years and the smart ones in the room when I got to the end of three and a half minutes realized that I had just with my co-workers of course the work that I presented was going to change everything all of their work for the last 40 years was a waste of time and they would just bin it and essentially that has happened um, they're still using those old programs because inertia is an amazing thing. But the only sensible way to model the flow of liquid plastics is to use uh, some derivation of the approach first tried, uh, first proposed by my boss. So in one very real sense, at that time in the world, maybe out of 200 scientists, there was my boss, my uh, co-PhD student and me. The three of us totally overturned a scientific orthodoxy in computer modeling. And so for me to hear about a, uh, for me to hear about the idea that 99% of scientists agree with something carries absolutely zero weight. I don't care. <laughs> I, I do know that computer modeling the entire atmosphere of the world is something that we are a long, long, long way from being able to do. We do not have anything like the uh, computer power 
to put a grid on the world that's at the resolution that it needs to be. We don't know the, we don't, we specifically don't know the underlying equations. We've got very little idea what impact the sun has and, and uh, known sun cycles has on our, on our environment. We have no idea how plants react to the increase in CO2, uh, whether they'll put out more O2 to back counterbalance. We don't know how our planet works. We haven't been measuring it accurately enough for long enough. Um, even the starting conditions are a complete disaster to measure. We cannot measure the temperature of our world. We don't know how to do it. We have many, many, many different approaches. We have lots of ways of changing the data. We do not have consistency of measurement going back any significant length of time. Um, we have changing data points. If you build, for example, a temperature me measuring state, uh, uh, stand, uh, and you build it away from a city, for example, but urban sprawl means that the city sprawls out so it touches that weather, weather monitoring sta station. One can reasonably assume that temperatures will, arise, will rise in the vicinity of it. And suddenly, you cannot now compare that measurement to something that happened 30 years ago. We do not have many centuries worth of satellite data because we haven't known how to put satellites in orbit for long enough. All in all, the entire science and a so-called science behind climate change is just extraordinarily ropey. Uh, I'm not saying, and absolutely not saying, that the climate isn't changing. Of course it's changing. What I'm saying is that for us as humans to say that we did it is unmeasurable. I'm sure we've had some effect. I am absolutely positive that we are not clever enough to measure the impact of what we've done. And then we get to the real piece de resistance, the CO2 delusion itself at the centre of all this. At the centre is this idea that because we've put CO2 into the atmosphere in greater numbers than has ever happened uh, in the reasonable distant past, though of course CO2 has been much higher in, in pre-human eras, because we put some CO2 in, there's this idea that if we pull it out, or, or reduce the rate at which we're putting it in, that this will have some magical effect and will go back to whatever it was before that we liked so much. I, I just can't buy that. That is just nonsense. It, it's, like, it's like thinking that if you stir your coffee backwards, the milk will jump out. I, I don't get it. I just, I don't see how just focusing on this one pollutant, which isn't even a pollutant, CO2, is the answer. Absolutely, I'm against local smog and the noxious emissions that are coming from the back of the diesel car that I'm driving back to Tel Aviv because my electric car system failed. Absolutely, I'm against that kind of local pollution. But the overall, uh, the overall demonization of just this one gas, CO2, which naturally occurs in the, in the atmosphere and always has and always will and is breathed out by all of us, uh, strikes me as fairly bizarre. I'm talking too long. I wonder if anybody's still listening. Anyway, um, that's my stream of consciousness on CO2 and modelling and um, the climate delusion. And meanwhile, 443 has opened up and uh, if I flick back to Waze, I will get a new estimate of my arrival time in Tel Aviv, which will be a little more accurate than the earlier one. Um, and that's an example of fantastically good computer simulation. Anyway, that's all for now. I'm going to try and figure out the buttons to stop this live broadcast, but I might have to wait until I hit the traffic at the uh, junction with 443, at the, at the uh, checkpoint which I'm coming to. Uh, let's film the way.